A talent is here from the Soil Learning Centre and um, we'd like to welcome you all online today with Elaine. We're looking at focusing on soil for the next hour. Healthy soil, how do we get the world, everyone, to understand the importance of what a healthy soil is for all of us? So while you're on the call today, you will be hearing questions people have about creating a healthy soil. And I suggest while you're listening that you stop and think what you need to know to get your soil healthy too. So I'd now like to welcome you to Dr. Elaine Ingham. <laughs> Hello Elaine. How are you doing Helen? Very well, thank you. Um, Elaine is currently president of the Soil Food Web, a business that she created to support the knowledge and understanding of soil worldwide. So Elaine, some of the people on the call, it's their first time hearing you, so would you like to say just a little bit about yourself? Um, I am a soil microbiologist. I have a PhD in soil microbiology. Um, I have a double major in biology and chemistry as an undergraduate student, a Bachelor of Arts in biology and chemistry from St. Olaf College in Minnesota which is where I grew up and you can hear the accent every once in a while, I'm sure. Um, went to Texas A&M for my master's degree where I worked in marine microbiology and started to realize some of the problems with methodology when it comes to really understanding environmental um, situations. The methodology that we used that was popular, that was the way to do it, when I was working on my master's degree clearly d was inappropriate and so working on the microorganisms inside the digestive systems of oysters realized that problem that direct microscopy was much better a determinant of the biology that was actually present in the soil um, in or in oyster digestive systems at that time rather than plate counts better than CO2 evolution better than enzyme assay you know, all of those things went on to do my uh, PhD work at Colorado State University um, in soil microbiology where I developed the methodology for looking at all of these different sets of organisms um, all at the same time. Uh, we used to have to do each individual group of organisms separate. Um, there was a whole different extraction method, um, very different ways of, of looking at the different organisms so you would be seeing different amounts of soil or more or you know and it was impossible to compare um, so streamlining the process making different soils different assess uh, different soil assessments um, comparable and uh, looking at bacteria and fungi and protozoa and nematodes in the same sample so we could assay all four groups um, with the same with the same um, bit of soil that we were looking at um, so I, um, I did my um, postdoc at uh, Colorado State University uh, where we really started understanding what the set of organisms are that um, are best at each stage of succession. And of course our crops are part of that successional system. So if we understand natural succession and how nature selects for the growth of these different plants at e in different stages along that successional process, we can set the stage for the crops we want to grow instead of having weeds, instead of having a, a situation that's more appropriate for a different plant to grow. Make sure that it's right for the kind of plant you're trying to grow. Um, if we do that, we um, get so much more benefit um, if we have that biology in the soil. So the different benefits are, of course, if if you can get the beneficial organisms back into the system, you have those things that prevent the disease-causing organisms from being able to find your plant. Uh, there is no space, there's no food, there's no way that a disease-causing organism can attack your plant. Uh, we have to make sure that the system is going to be aerobic, um, and that's part of setting the conditions so that the disease-causing organisms, most of which require reduced oxygen conditions, in order to be able to attack your plant. Um, we have to have good oxygen moving into your soil. So that, so that means we have to build structure and um, 
good structure requires that the bacteria are present, building the microaggregates. The fungi are present, building macroaggregates. We've got the protozoa and the nematodes and the microarthropods, our earthworms present doing the jobs that they're supposed to do in building the larger pore spaces. We have to have oxygen and water and your root systems to be able to grow down as deep as they possibly can. And root systems of plants are not restricted to the top two or three inches or four or five inches of your soil. Absolutely, that is an artifact of the damage that human beings have done to soil. It's not soil if your roots aren't going down that deep, unless, of course, you want to grow weeds. Okay, So um, our root systems of any of our crop plants should be growing much deeper than that. And if they do, then they're going to be getting the oxygen down that deep because in order for the roots to grow that deep, you have to have good structure. Well, if the bacteria and fungi are doing their thing, then um, they're going to be directed by the plant, if you will, from the exudates coming out of the root systems of the plants. The plants feed those organisms that make the enzymes to do the things the plant requires and it needs. So it's going to direct certain species of bacteria and fungi to grow and make the enzymes to solubilize the mineral nutrients from the rocks, from the sand, from the silt, from the clay, from the organic matter. There is no soil on this planet that lacks the nutrients to grow plants. And yet, you know, then people will say, but when I put my inorganic fertilizer out there, my plant grows better. So how can that be true? Um, because if you don't have the biology in that soil, yes, your plant is not getting the nutrients that it needs. The soluble forms of nutrients aren't present. And so if you put an inorganic fertilizer out, then you see growth. But if we put the proper biology into that soil and we get nutrient cycling going, which requires bacteria and fungi in the proper balances, it requires protozoa and nematodes, microarthropods, earthworms in the proper balances to have nutrient cycling functioning. And then the plant is going to get all the nutrients it needs in the proper balances. So your plant tastes as good as it should. It's got the flavor. It has the nutrition for human beings or for animals. So we've got to make sure that whole life is present back in that soil. We have to stop destroying it to do uh, over tillage through inappropriate tillage practices. We've got to stop using the toxic chemicals that kill these organisms. We have to stop with the pesticides. We have to stop with the inorganic fertilizers because every single inorganic fertilizer is a salt that will kill your plants, that will kill your microorganisms in your soil even way before it's going to kill your plants. So we can't be using those things anymore. Um, short term, if you don't really understand what you're doing, you think that this more rapid growth of your plants is a wonderful thing, but your nutrients are all unbalanced. When you put out an inorganic fertilizer that has one or two or three nutrients in it, because your plant needs them all in proper balance, not just one or two or three, not just nitrogen, not just phosphorus, not, not just sulfur. Your plant requires all the nutrients and the proper balances. And without the biology present in your soil, your plants are never going to be healthy. They're never going to be resistant to diseases and pests and, and problems. We need to make certain that we get water stored in the soil. That's one last really important thing, especially in arid systems. We have to make sure that every drop of dew, every drop of rain, that falls to the surface of that soil, infiltrates into the soil, and is stored in that soil. So your roots can grow deep and find that water so you don't have to water. Um, when we have compaction layers just a couple inches below the surface of the soil, compaction that we've imposed by the practices that we've been performing for the last 100, 150 years, um, we're imposing a compaction layer, and so your water only goes down a short distance and it then is very easily evaporated as soon as it gets dry, as soon as it starts to get warm. We have to have the water going deeper, and we have to have our roots going deeper. And if we do that, we can, in comparison to conventional agricultural systems, we can reduce water use by as much as 70% and still get equal or higher yields. And 
the food, the produce produced is much higher nutrient quality and we don't have the weeds and we don't have the diseases. So we really have to get back to this. We've got to get people understanding how nature works and start working with nature instead of in constant warfare with her. Because of course, head-to-head -head competition between us and Mother Nature, who's going to win? Not us. So we better start paying attention. And hopefully this course is going to be a really good vehicle to teach a, another group of people um, how to start making that conversion to working with nature. Thank you, Elaine. Um, there are a huge amount of questions that have come in, so we've had to be a bit um, choosy about the ones that we're going to answer, but um, we know you're all going to benefit from them. And if you are thinking right now of taking the Critical Invisible Soil Fertility Solutions Revealed course. This will give you a bit of a taste of the sort of questions that we go into. So I'm going to go on to the first question and I'm going to go back to Elaine. Um, just a moment. Right, here's Elaine again. And uh, hello again, Elaine. So Oops. Arthur. <laughs> Our first question, there's two actually, one's come in from Bart and another one from Deepak about the pathway to take to recover soil life and enhance soil quality parameters. So what they want to know is if they start from the worst case scenario, monoculture, ploughing, weed pressure, low organic matter in the soil, how many seasons uh, will you need at least? when doing what to bring back the soil quality and Deepak further says um, can we guarantee that we won't need any pesticides on the crops and that we'll all have healthy food on the planet. So over to you Elaine. Well the, the pathway to move along is to first of all go out and assess what biology is left in your soil. Sometimes at small scale uh, if you're not dependent on um, your garden, uh, you're not dependent on your, the land that you're growing on for your, um, for your income. Um, you can get away with just looking at what the plants are telling you. Uh, quite often, the plant is a, a medium to, that Mother Nature uses to tell you things are really, really bad. The difficulty is uh, it's a, a bit more your, uh, of a guess. Okay, my plant is sick, it's unhealthy, it's yellow, it, it, it's wilty. There's many, many reasons why that problem could be there. So it's usually better, if you can, to go ahead and uh, assess the organisms in, this, in the soil. So we want to be first looking at what is the biology that's left in your soil. How bad are things? Uh, are, are you sterile? You basically have nothing left. It's not soil, it's dirt, the four-letter D word in the world of soil science. If it's dirt, that means basically we have no good organisms. We maybe have a lot of diseases. We have a lot of insect pests left in there. Um, but then we got to start from ground zero. We've got to put everything back. Uh, if you're lucky, you'll do a soil assessment, and you'll be able to see that we've got something left. We at least have some bacteria. Maybe we've got lots of bacteria. Maybe we have lots of bacteria and a little bit. Well, you can see where I could go through all the possible combinations of bacteria, fungi, protozoa, nematodes, microarthropods and so forth, but you want to be using that assessment tool, a microscope, and we can teach you how to use that microscope. Uh, we're not talking about really expensive microscopes, we're talking about microscopes that are about $350 with a camera and the software to hook it up to your laptop and be able to share pictures of, of organisms with all of your friends, with people all over the world, and get help for uh, what's wrong with the soil? What do I have to fix? So the first thing you have to do is assess how bad things are. The second thing you want to think about is what is it I really want to be growing on this um, land? Um, do I want to be growing weeds? Uh, am I trying to grow dandelions to make dandelion wine? Am I trying to grow broccoli? Or am I going to grow corn or wheat or blueberries or um, orchard trees? 
And each of those plants have a different set of microorganisms that need to be present in the soil. We need to understand that fungal to bacterial biomass ratio. We need to know how many protozoa, nematodes, what kind of nematodes do we have to have in your soils so that nutrient cycling will happen, so that soil structure will be built, that the um, conditions in your soil will be inappropriate for the diseases and the pests to be able to attack and um, cause problems with your plants. So that's the second thing we have to figure out is what precisely is it that you want to grow and then you know what you're missing in that soil. It's, it's just that simple. Um, what do we have to add back? And the easiest way to add in the indigenous massive diversity of the organisms in your neighborhood, in your part of the world, is to make your own compost. You're going to make compost out of your own waste materials. Um, and that's a whole section of the course is uh, helping people understand how to make compost. Uh, what are the starting materials? How do you know that you're going to get the full diversity back into your soil? How do you know what the balances of the fungi, bacteria, protozoa, nematodes are, are in your compost? And that's all about the food that you're putting into the compost. The more different kinds of foods, but balanced to grow your bacteria or fungi, um, that's what we've got to teach people to do. And of course then when you're doing your compost, you cannot allow that composting process to grow the diseases, to grow the bad guys, which means it has to stay aerobic. Uh, you cannot let this material go anaerobic under any condition unless you really like diseases and pests and that's what you want to be inoculating back into your soil. It's got to stay aerobic because the good guys require that aerobic condition. So it's really a pretty straightforward process in, you know, what, how do we figure out where you're at? Um, how do you know what to add back? Um, and then we're going to check and make sure your compost has that. If you don't like putting a solid on, if it's too expensive, if it's too difficult, um, then we'll turn that compost into a liquid form, into an extract or a tea. So we're going to figure out what needs to happen. You go out and you put the compost on, did you fix things? How far along the way did you get um, with the first application? Do you need to put out something on the foliage to protect your plants during that first growing season because you didn't get everything established in your soil the balances of the organisms aren't right. So you don't have all the nutrient cycling, you don't have um, the resistant plants because they don't have the nutrients in them. So we have to be doing some testing and going out and putting on the organisms, checking and making sure that they're surviving, that they're growing, that they're increasing. And if they're not, then we have to put this next application in. If you've got neighbors that are applying pesticides and drift happens and it kills the organisms in your soil, you need to know that that happened and that you need to go out and put another application of compost or extract or tea out onto your property. Or maybe it's just in a part of the property, the part of the property closest to your neighbor. Um, wherever your organisms were lost, um, we need to put them back. And how rapidly can you recover your soil? We can go from soil that basically has no biology left. It's not soil, it's dirt. And within a month, we can have it back to a condition of health where there are no weeds, there are no pesticide requirements, you don't have the diseases, you don't have um, the root systems only going down a couple of inches, they're going down feet. Um, and that can be in the first growing season. Um, if you don't get the biology established correctly, it could take you years. If you don't pay attention, if you don't really know what you're doing, if you're just trying to hope, you know, cross your fingers and throw some more stuff out, stuff out there, you may never achieve the goal. And uh, certainly that's the way we've been going in the world of um, agronomy, of uh, modern conventional agriculture. You put out a pesticide and it doesn't fix the problem. It fixes the it. Uh, um, reduces a symptom for a short period of time. It doesn't prevent the pests from coming back. It doesn't prevent the diseases from coming back. But that's what we need to do with our soil. So the diseases and the pests don't come back. We have to make certain the conditions are not appropriate for the diseases and the pests to return. 
So, uh, you know, how do we know if we've got the soil quality? You have to be understanding the biology that's appropriate for the plant you're trying to grow and recognize that not every plant is going to grow well in one standard set of uh, bacteria, fungi, protozoa, and nematodes. The ratios and the balances are different for different plants, and we have to understand that so we make the soil healthy for the plant we, we want to grow. Um, there's not one set of organism standards that we can set for soil quality because it's relative to the climate. So rel relative to whether you're in the tropics or you're in the temperate zones, um, whether you're in a wet climate or a dry climate. So all of these ha things have to be factored in. Thank you. And Elaine, um that goes on to another question here because, and I actually it's covered quite a few of the questions here about different, you know, conditions. But one of the questions here is quite relevant to, I think, a lot of people who don't really have the money to buy the microscope and things like that. Now, I know they could look and see if a school nearby might have a microscope or a hospital or something. But, um, and you mentioned looking at your plants and things, but the question here from Rick is, uh, how could you t could you tell them specifically how poor farmers and gardeners can best, with the principles you espouse, without the use of microscopes and soil tests and things, do so with a considerable degree of confidence? Uh, would you comment on that, please, Elan? I, I sincerely doubt that people can't afford a $350 microscope um, coming with a camera. They're not that expensive. Um, maybe a whole village, you know, in, in certain parts of the world, maybe the whole village has to go together. Maybe the, uh, the, uh, the doctor or the veterinarian would buy one or have one. Um, how can they be getting along without a microscope? And so um, training somebody to understand soil, that's you know what what's going on in soil and what the organisms look like um, that would probably be m more of the expense that they've got to take training someplace but then it might be one person for the whole neighborhood for the whole town for the whole city uh, and everyone brings their samples to them and for you know some um, support by the by the city or by the um, governing body would would pay to have the samples done because this is, well, it's national security, really, that we're talking about. The ability to grow your food, the best food possible, using recycled materials. You're going to take all your wastes and uh, convert them back into something that will grow really healthy crops um, once you get this up and going properly. Compost is made from uh, waste material that we otherwise throw in a landfill or we try to get rid of it in some way. We burn it or um, inappropriate ways of dealing with these things. So, you know, I, I don't think these uh, microscopes are that expensive. Uh, maybe people are thinking of the really expensive microscopes we have at Soil Food Web where we're doing some fairly specialized assessments for certain situations. But the average general person doesn't need that expensive microscope. So $350, does, is, most people spend that on, on um, other things already anyway. So what was the other part of the question? I, I, I forgot. Sorry. Well, I was really saying how could they be confident without the microscope? You know, are you looking at someone right now knowing that they're going in the right way with their soil? Now, you did mention, you know, observing plants and things like that. And you did mention in your introduction about, you know, good root growth and things like that. So I'm suggesting that um, you've already covered it by saying, well, there are, uh, you know, uh, visual observations one can make and you can use your nose to smell bad compost. Um, a metal rod and push it down into the soil and find out if you've got compaction or where that compaction is. And so where is your water holding up and then going down the hill instead of staying in your soil. Um, the roots can't go down deep. So there are a number of things and, and we'll go over, in the class we'll go over um, you know, exactly how you do all of these things. What are the smells that are bad and what are the smells that are positive? Um, can we be looking for 
the organisms using a teaspoon in your eyeballs, sure, you're, you can gain certain things. Yes, um, and we, we do have the introductory of getting to know your soil visual soil test too, so I agree with you. So let's move on to the next question. Um, right, and it's actually um, an interesting one. There's a new product that's appeared which is biochar and Martin wants to know if carbon is so important in our soil for moisture and nutrient storage, which he's right, as well as for microbial life, he wants to know why sustainable charcoal manufacturing for incorporation into the soil isn't a mainstream process. So would you like to comment about that please, Elaine? Biochar, we probably have to take a step back and understand exactly what biochar is. Um, you've taken your carbon, your waste materials, and you've heated them to an extremely high temperature to the point where the structure starts to crystallize and um, all of the organic matter is burned off. It uh, escapes as um, gases that hopefully people are collecting and using to power um, engines and things like that make you know useful energy. So the biochar is crystallized carbon um, pellets and there's actually no life left in it. There is no mineral availability. Um, there's nothing soluble left that your plants can utilize. So very inert kind of carbon in that material. Um, you have to put the organisms back into that material. You, you've got to put some foods back into that material as well if you want to keep the microorganisms alive where the biochar is sitting around in the bag. Um, when you add that biochar to the soil that maybe we should call it a, well, I mean the term biochar doesn't that suggest that there's biology in there that it's a biologically friendly compound when in fact it's not. Um, for, to call it biochar we really should have to require that biology is put back into that charred material, into that crystallized carbon. Um, so if you put it back in with the right sets of microorganisms, then the biochar is still a very inert material. It's very difficult for the microorganisms to utilize their enzymes to retrieve any of the nutrients that might be left in the, that crystallized material. So um, when you add biochar into the soil, it's an, a material that gives you some physical structure. And in a lot of the experiments that were done, they didn't control for that properly. They compared soils, fields that weren't tilled, uh, that weren't, um, you know, uh, the comp compaction in those soils were not, was not broken up with areas where they mixed and tilled the biochar into the soil and uh, and then compared those two things and it's, you know it's not correct because really you have to compare a tilled field with a tilled field with biochar so there are some questions uh, then in, in my mind uh, is the biochar just beneficial because you have to till it in, you have to mix it into the soil and that's what's really giving you the benefit. If you don't put in enough biochar to give you adequate physical structure, will you actually get any benefit? What if you put, just put the, the crystallized material in with no biology? Hmm. The, the char material, the biochar material does have a lot of cracks and crevices. It has a lot of little chambers to allow the microorganisms to um, find homes, uh, protected areas where the um, pred their predators um, cannot come in and cannot get them. So condominium housing for microorganisms, but you have to remember to put the microorganisms in with the biochar. So you have the beneficials, good aerobic material as long as you're putting the biochar in in a high enough concentration. We are putting carbon back into the soil, but in a lot of ways I think it would be better to take that same waste material and turn it into compost, which comes with the indigenous sets of organisms in the place that the compost was made. So don't have to be um, you know, taking all the waste material far away to a 
biochar plant and then transporting it back, which is expensive. And really, that's the most expensive part about any of these agricultural wastes is you don't want to have to transport them very far because that's what makes them expensive. Uh, do the composting in your own neighborhood and, and develop your own organisms that are indigenous and already selected for your habitat. Okay, thanks Elaine. Um, so the next question is coming from uh, someone who, this is another common one, and it's about ha uh, using synthetic fertilizers based on a soil test to get a balance of growth. Um, this is from, let me find out where she is. Uh, Mary, and she wants to know that can you, like she, she's growing rice, corn, plants and staples, can you have enough of the macro elements and trace mineral, minerals for optimum growth and grain production if you are using organic methods? And she says, please consider the fact that most planted areas for such staples have been managed using mainly inorganic inputs without the soil biology included in its rightful place. So in other words, they're having success in, in growing their crops and, uh, you know, so why don't you just keep going with this strategy? Um, the biggest problem with the current synthetic fertilizer approach is that we're destroying water. Uh, we're destroying lakes and rivers and streams and uh, oceans, um, seas. We're rapidly approaching the place where we're not going to have any drinkable water. And, and that's actually what's going to destroy our environment for human beings to stay alive uh, long before we run out of food, uh, the most, the, the greatest problem is a lack of clean water, not a uh, inability to grow food. We already grow all the food we need to feed everybody a very good diet um, on the planet. So why are people starving to death? It is not a lack of food. It's a lot of lack of political will to get the food to the people who are starving. So. You know, the thing that's probably going to kill us first is the fact that when we put these synthetic fertilizers on our soils, well, and they're not soil anymore, that we're dealing with their dirt. We don't have the organisms to hold those soluble inorganic fertilizers in the soil. And so 80% of every inorganic fertilizer that is placed on our soils, 80% um, is going to be washed away into the groundwater, into the surface waters, and ultimately end up harming everything downstream. That's um, why we have dead zones in so many places in the oceans and in um, our, like the Gulf of Mexico. The, it's no longer a 200 mile across dead zone. It, it's getting larger every day. Um, when does the whole Gulf of Mexico become dead? because of the inorganic fertilizers that we're pour pouring on our soils in agricultural systems. And I'm not pointing a finger at just farmers, um, urban, suburban um, people growing plants, their yards, their lawns, their, we're just as bad, if not worse, a source of pollution. So we are, anyone who grows plants or anyone who eats plants is in some way equally as... Um, at fault here, except for maybe or people who eat organic food. Um, because hopefully in organic systems, we have the biology. It's at least returning and coming back. And so we're holding more of the nutrients rather than losing them. So um, part of that answer, too, is that you have to understand um, what the synthetic fertilizer people are telling you with the soil chemistry test. They are not telling you about most of the nutrients that are present in your soil. They are happily ignoring about 99% of the nutrients that are already present in your soil. There is more than adequate phosphorus, sulfur, magnesium, calcium, sodium, potassium, iron, zinc, well, chlor, anything you want to talk about. Go and take a look at a basic soil chemistry textbook, and it will show you tables that give you the concentrations of all of these mineral nutrients in all soils on the planet. They're present in the bedrock. They're present in your rocks and sands and gravels and silts. They're in your clays. There is no soil on the planet that lacks the nutrients to grow plants. 
What we lack is a way to get those nutrients from a not available form for your plants and convert them into an available form for your plants. And of course, it is the biology that does that for you. If you kill that biology, there's no way to get at the nutrients that are in your soils and you're stuck then buying synthetic fertilizers. The problem is we don't have the organisms to hold on to those soluble inorganic fertilizers and so they're going to be lost and they end up in your drinking water and now you're paying outrageous amounts of money to get that water cleaned up and most of our drinking water even coming out of the taps in most um, towns and cities and villages uh, tastes horrible. Um, it's got all these chemicals in it because they've got to use such outrageous things to try to prevent growth of um, harmful organisms in the pipes on the way to from the water treatment plant to your home. Um, so when does the general public wise up and start saying we just can't keep doing these crazy things? Um, synthetic and fertilizers are only going to work for a short period and we're coming to the end of that short period. Um, or we can kind of uh, say goodbye to human beings really because we are so fouling our nest. We have to go back to working with nature and in, instead of against nature. Okay, thanks Elaine. Um, we'll go on to the next question. I'll just get this little um, webinar organized here. Um, I'm going on to some qu short questions now Elaine um, because we've got a lot of short questions about compost and compost teas and um, I think you've given a very good background about the importance of not using inorganic fertilizers. It is about the future and people need to, um, we've got a man here who says if you do not change now you're, you're heading to disaster and he said you can, you've got a choice. You can either go slowly or you can go quickly. Take your choice but you're going over the cliff and uh, I think that's what you're basically saying there that people need to understand how important it is to understand their soil. And it's, so, yeah, and it's not really that we're going to go over the cliff. If we change our ways, if we start mm. um, growing food with Mother Nature, supporting how the, the system's supposed to work, we can pull back uh, within one year. We could take all of the sea, excess CO2 in the atmosphere and put it back into the soil if we would just put compost back in there, back in the soil, hold on to the carbon and then nothing leaches, nothing is lost from the soil if we get the organisms, the, the organic matter back into that soil. Every, every little bit of plant material that goes down onto the surface of the soil can be held but we've got to have the life back in the soil in order to do that. Precisely. So, on to the short questions. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, how critical are the amounts of each in ingredient in recipes for both compost and compost teas? Like, do you have to measure or weigh it? And we're going to keep these short, Elaine, so if you can uh, just tell him whether they're important or not, that'd be great. Um, I eyeball it. Um, it uh, don't get too too concerned about uh, volume or weight. Um, I I generally take you know like uh, ten buckets when I'm making my small compost. Ten buckets, six of them are going to have woody material, and I try to pack them all in to about the same density. Um, three of them are going to be green plant material, and I try to pack that into the same density. And then my high nitrogen, uh, one bucket of that, and uh, you know just keep adding those relative amounts of the high nitrogen green and woody. So it doesn't have to be perfect, it doesn't have to be to the tenth decimal place. Uh, as long as you can see that we're generally a little bit higher on our woodies, kind of average on our, our greens and 10% on our high nitrogens, uh, that's going to give you a good mix for your compost piles. Okay, right. correct. Don't go crazy on trying to be precise. Yeah, and we do go through that on the course with your how to make 
good organic compost. So uh, we have another question, compost tea and elm trees from Don. He says, as you know, Calgary has been hit with a terrible case of scale on elm trees in the last several years. And he's noticed more woolly elm caterpillars and woolly elm elf aphids. Uh, what can we use organically to either control the pests or improve the health of our elms? Yes or no, can you inject compost tea? Um, actually, it, it typically only takes um, one season worth of work to um, do the conversion. Scale is really easy to get rid of. Most of the time, one application of a good compost tea, but you have to know that the organisms are in the compost. You must know that you've grown them up to high levels in the compost tea, and it has to be tea um, because the organisms must stick to those leaf surfaces, especially the underside of the leaves. When we're dealing with scale, have to stick. the organisms have to stick to the branches, to the um, um, all the parts of the plant that the scale may be sitting on. Um, and usually one application of a compost tea takes care of it. Now, if you spray a compost tea and the scale doesn't go away, then it wasn't compost tea. Um, you sprayed brown water, and brown water never did anything to deter scale. Um, so you've got to make sure you're putting the organisms back out that will compete with and make that the surfaces of those plants unpleasant places for the scale insects to hang out. Um, aphids, the same thing. Um, one good application of a compost tea. But now you've got to go after the places that those scale and that the aphids are coming from. You've got to find the place their eggs were laid, and you've got to find out where any larval stages are overwintering. And that means start working on the soil. You have to now get the soil back into a condition of health, or the scale and the aphids just come back because you didn't fix the problem. You just dealt with a symptom, and um, that just doesn't cut mustard long term. You've got to really deal with the problem, which is down in the soil. Okay, thanks. Um, so the next question, um, and we'll have to keep this short, Elaine. We're running out of time and I'm trying to rush through. Uh, Damien wants to know, can we use any manure for compost? He's wondering if farmed animals that have fed anti-worm and antibiotic medication are okay to use that man manure and put it on a compost in situ. Um, so comments on that, please, Elaine. Um, if you're going to be using manure in your compost, um, animals that have been being given antibiotics, typically not a problem. Uh, antibiotics are proteins, and there's always some microorganism that is more than happy to use that material as a food resource. So the antibiotics disappear quite rapidly within a day or two of uh, addition into a compost pile. Often they have to be aerobic conditions those, those, for those antibiotics to be used. Dewormers are a, a much different problem. Um, you've got to make sure that you have the right microorganisms in your um, compost to be able to decompose those um, materials. And so typically it's better to take any manure that you think probably has deworming medicine in it of some kind where we've, you're actually dealing with toxic materials that are going to be very difficult to break down, typically something with the heavy metals in it or something. Um, you've got to um, let that heat to quite a high temperature, let the organisms growing in that manure um, deal with the problems. Um, so I would set that manure to one side and let it um, um, heat and get up to high temperature and, and deal with the deworming medicine first. And then take that manure, once it's cooled back down, take that manure and use it as a green material in your compost pile. Don't use it as high nitrogen because you got to let the normal sets of microorganisms chew up that deworming medicine, get rid of it. No more than 5% of your pile could be manure that has deworming medicine in it or you can shut down the whole composting process. You, you won't get heat. You also have to be very careful that a deworming medicine with a worm compost because it will kill the worms, so, which is why it was put into that the animal's food to begin with to kill the worms. So 
Yeah, the dewormers, much more difficult to deal with and be careful on those. Thanks, Elaine. And following straight on with that, um, there's a question from Rochelle. Have you come across any negative consequences from people using commercially sourced microbial inoculums which contain high levels of trichoderma bacillus pseudonomas, streptomyces, etc., which are all well known as soil predators on a regular basis? We've definitely seen um, a huge amount of damage with the trichoderma. People don't really understand that um, trichoderma of any species will go after any fungus. They are not specific um, to just one or two species of disease-causing fungi. No evidence really for that in the scientific literature. You know, some people will put uh, plate, plates with uh, Pythium or Phytophthora growing on it, put a trichoderma in there and say, oh, look, this uh, trichoderma attacks and consumes Pythium and Phytophthora. Uh, yeah, but these trichoderma don't stop with just the bad guy fungi. They'll go after anything. So you can well, and we have dealt several times with people who've had this happen. They've had really good um, mycorrhizal colonization on the root systems of their plants, so their their turf has been great. They're, you know, really happy, healthy palm trees, and um, they start spraying with a um, starter uh, material um, that somebody started putting trichoderma high amounts of trichoderma spores into the starter mix, and just totally destroy their mycorrhizal fungi, and then watch their plants become sick and unhealthy. Um, that trichoderma takes out um, some of the organisms in the soil. Now, pseudomonads, the other things that you mentioned, bacillus, I have not seen a demonstration of um, those organisms causing this kind of problems. Uh, bacillus usually is in balance with many other things. Bacillus species of bacteria, limited sets of food resources, so um, they're really only active for short periods under very specific conditions. Your plant is the one that's going to be really pushing, or your plant should be the thing that's really pushing whether those bacteria wake up and are starting to perform because it's the plant that puts out the food to grow those organisms on the surfaces of the plants. Um, Pseudomonas, same thing. Pseudomonas, most pseudomonads are really good at decomposing pesticides. So that's typically why we use them or they put out a material that is repugnant to um, insect pests. Well, your plant's not going to put out the food to grow those pseudomonads or those bacillus that, that do that um, until the plant is being attacked by those particular insects. So the plant's going to grow what it needs. And to some extent, that's like, oh, whew, human beings aren't going to screw up so bad. If um, that's the case, because um, it's it's a limiting factor out there in the real world. Thanks, and um, uh, we're getting to our final question time. So the one I think is a very general one and an interesting one is: so where do people start? Um, <laughs> Doing the course, I say. <laughs> yeah, take the course. Um, you you want to go out there and think about. Uh, if you didn't use any pesticides, if you didn't use any, any, any inorganic fertilizers, what would happen with your crop this year? What would happen with your garden? What would happen with your lawn? To any place where you're trying to grow plants and you're trying to achieve a certain result, can you do it in a sustainable fashion? And uh, if the answer is, whoa, if I'm not out there doing anything, this is just going to turn into a big weed field. Well, then you will know that you don't have any of the right organisms into your so in your soil. and now you need to be assessing what's there and how are you going to fix it. You, how do you get those organisms back into your soil? And that's what this course is all about. Thanks, Elaine. We'll just stay there. Um, we have an invitation for you all to um, enrol in Elaine's course and to have a lifetime of soil knowledge. But we, what we want to do is to just let you know and we're making it easy for you to decide that the course comes with no risk because you have a whole month to, um, if you don't like the course, which is highly unlikely, 
you'll get your money back. We want people to give it a go and really understand their soil. It is the future. If you are still thinking that you're going to make money in the decades to come, sticking with inorganic fertilisers, it's just not going to happen. This is really allowing Mother Nature to do her work. In the course, let me just go over it. You get the six modules, which are delivered over three months, and in between, you, we, we have live webinars with Dr. Elaine Ingham, like today. And um, after each webinar, after each module, there is a self-assessing quiz. And if people want to receive a certificate of completion at the end, this is up to you whether you want to. Some people on the last course chose not to do that. The others who did said it was a wonderful experience to actually concrete the course in their heads about the soil um, and we do have some extra goodies thrown in but if you um, open the um, offer on the side you'll find a list of what the course offers and we really really look forward to you joining us and discovering the joys of a healthy soil. Um, so Elaine I really want to thank you today for your participation and um, you know, I, I just think you're wonderful. I know you're here, you're passionate about the soil and it's a gift to us that you're here and I think everyone's got a sense today that you do know what you're talking about, you're continually researching and people can be very, very confident that you'll be honest with them, you'll be straight with them and uh, I know you've worked on some very tough projects and got, got results like you worked on the trees to recover them in big towns and things like this. Your results are there and I have heard you say, well, I really don't know enough about that. I'll go and ask so-and-so or something or I'll find out. So I think that's a great credit to you. You are a real researcher, uh, you know, and um, I really recommend everyone who's here to click on that I'm interested button to find out more today. So Elaine, I can't thank you enough and look forward to talking to you soon on the course. Okay. All right, so we'll say bye-bye for now. Okay. Okay, thank you.